In section 2.1, we start this chapter of growth models, which basically are predicting something changing over time, usually growing over time. Just like in chapter one, we have money growing over time through interest. Now we're sort of stepping back and looking at a more general case where we're looking at anything growing. It could be a population, it could be any number of other things that we'll see in the examples in this section. So in this chapter, we're looking at how things grow and looking for a model that predicts how that growth can happen so we can project forward. In section 2.1, we're going to look at what are called linear models, where we model growth using a straight line. And it turns out this is just like simple interest. And we're not going to make too much of a comparison between the two. But if you go back after looking at this section and look at the simple interest formula, for instance, you'll notice that there's some linear growth happening, especially if you look at a graph. So this early part of the section, there's a brief introduction with an example of training for a marathon and adding a certain amount each week to how far you run. So if you start out running three miles per run, and then each week you add half a mile to that, you can de define what's called a recursive relationship. Now, we're not going to do this in any examples. Uh, you're not going to be tested on this at all. It's just shown here as a way to set up the more familiar equation we're going to use to model linear growth. But you can read through this, and the important piece is this final model where we have P with a little subscript of T equals 3 plus 0.5 T. Now, the subscript on T isn't really super important. It's just telling us that that's a population at some future time. So if you drop off that T subscript, it's not a huge deal. But the T over here is a time variable. And you can plug in any number of weeks you're interested in to figure out how far you'll be running at that future value. So don't get too lost in the notation. Uh, this, again, the subscript of T is just there to kind of remind us of what the variable is. Uh, which stands for time. Notice that if you draw a graph of these results, it comes out to a straight line, which is why we call it linear growth. And then this box here is really important. This is the uh, general formula that we're going to use all throughout this section. So every example in section 2.1 has this one formula in common. And this is a general linear form that we can build. And it's important that you recognize the pieces that this left-hand side P with a subscript of T, which we might say P sub T, that's <clears throat> the population in the future. P with a subscript of zero, we might call that P zero or P naught sometimes. You'll hear people say that's the initial population, the initial amount of whatever we're measuring. And then D is the amount that it increases or decreases every time you take a step forward in time. So if you're measuring time in weeks, D would be how much it changes every week. If you're measuring time in days, D would be the amount it changes every day. And D can be positive if it's growing or negative if it's shrinking. And then T stands for time. So the number of time units you've moved forward. There's a little example here of how to recognize linear growth. It's a handy thing to know how to do that if you notice that there's a common difference between the amounts each time. So you measure whatever amount you have and then you measure it again and again and again at even time units and you notice that those differences are about the same or if they're exactly the same, then you might think that that's linear growth. If these weren't all exactly 12 but they were all about the same, you might still say that looks like linear growth. There's also a little note here that if you're familiar from your algebra classes with this linear form y equals mx plus b, this is the same kind of equation. We're just relabeling things to match this idea of a population instead of these more general letters that you would use in the y equals mx plus b form. But the concepts and the theory is exactly the same. There's an example here, and in this example, the goal is to find that growth rate. So what you're given is an initial value and a value later on, and then you can use that to solve for the growth rate 
and you can read through this, but basically you look at how much time passed and how much total growth you had, and if you divide those, that tells you how much growth there was each year. And so you can solve for that growth rate if you're given a little bit of information, specifically if you're given two populations. So you should look through this example carefully and make sure you can follow the concept there. Then the next example, it looks more complicated. Now we're given a bunch of data, but it turns out to be exactly the same question where all we do is we focus on the first and last points. And it's just like the previous example where we had two population values at two different points in time. So here we have two different amounts of gasoline consumption and then two different points in time and we can solve exactly the same way as the previous one. So it's nothing new having more data. The only thing the, that this data in the middle tells us is it gives us a way to verify that it does look linear. We can draw this graph and check that it's a nice straight line more or less uh, which tells us that a linear model is appropriate. So you can read through that example again and then once you build it you can make predictions in that using that model. And notice here, this is important, once you have a linear model, or really any model in this chapter, we'll do other models in, in later sections, but all of them basically have these two questions we want to answer. If you look back at this formula, generally the initial population is given, and then the growth rate is either given or we can find it, like in those two examples. Once we have this model built then, there are basically two variables. There's t and there's this p of t, the future population. So we can be given one and asked to find the other. For instance, you might say, what's the population three years from now? And so you would be given a value of t and asked to solve for the population. Or we could flip the question around and say, when will the population be 500? And that would be giving you a population value and asking you to solve for t. So those two types, of uh, two types of questions with that same equation are something to watch out for. Basically, every example, once you've built a model, is going to do one or both of these things. So when it comes to predicting the time that it reaches a certain value, you have to do a little bit of algebra here, and you can follow through when you read this example and watch the video. Predicting the population at a certain point in time is usually pretty straightforward. You just plug in t, do a little arithmetic, and you're done. But to solve for t, you have to do a little algebra. There's another way to do it, and I'm going to show you here how to use a calculator. So you should go through and follow this example, and ideally you should get your own calculator out and see if you can follow the same process. If you don't have a calculator like this, you can use a graphing calculator like Desmos, which I'll link from Blackboard, and if you graph just like we're doing here, Desmos will automatically show you where they intersect, where two lines intersect. So I'll show you that um, as we go through here. So if you're using a TI-83 or TI-84 or similar calculator, if you graph two lines, you can find where they intersect using uh, this option under one of the menus. So here's a little explanation of, of why this works. If you graph your data, you graph your straight line, and then you graph a horizontal line at the value you want to reach. So this line tells us the quote-unquote population throughout time, and we can see it increasing like this. What we want to know is when does this cross the line of 26 if we're looking at when we're ready to run 26 miles. So what we're doing is we're looking to see where this line crosses this horizontal line at y equals 26. And if you can find that point where they cross, you know that it's going to take you about 46 or 47 weeks. So on the calculator you can graph both lines and then if you zoom in and out appropriately you can see the two lines and how they cross and then to find the intersection you can go back to that calculate menu and hit the intersect option and with a little work you can find that intersection happens when x is 46 now it's using x to represent time, and y, which we're using to represent population or amount. When x is 46, after 46 weeks, the 
amount, the number of miles you can run will be 26. And so that those coordinates tell you the answer to your question. So you can go through and do that and um, again use your calculator to find the intersection of two lines. If uh, you don't have a calculator again, you can use Desmos instead. And as I said, I'll, I'll link to that. And on Desmos, it's very intuitive to graph two lines like this. And then if you just hover over them, you'll see their uh, intersection point highlighted. And you can click on it and see the coordinates of it. And if you want to see that in more detail, uh, let me know. There's one other uh, topic in this section, and that is going back to this example with a bunch of data. One way to find a line to model this is just to pick two points. The first and last is kind of a natural choice. You could pick any two of these to, to create a line. But there's a better way. It's a little more complicated, and we won't get into the details of it in this chapter. In the statistics chapter, we'll talk about how this all works in a little more detail. But this linear regression idea is basically a way to take all of the data and crunch it all down into one line of best fit. So again, the principles behind it and the, the details are um, not something we can cover quickly here. So in the statistics chapter, there's more, more detail if you're interested. But for now, we can use the calculator to do this. So if you enter the data, and again, you have to go into your calculator and, and do a little work to get some data entry set up. Once you enter the data, then you can go under the stat menu and there's an option to calculate a line using linear regression. And so you can follow these instructions. And again, you should follow along if you have a calculator like this. Uh, try doing this process and see what you get and make sure it works for you. So then you'll get a similar linear equation that way. And um, you can, again, either use the two points to create a line, or you can use all the points using linear regression. Obviously, on a homework question, I'll clarify one option or the other. But if you had a choice, you could do either one, and they, they might be relatively similar. You can also use Excel to do regression, and you can follow this process here. Um, you can go through this in detail again. If you pull up Excel on your own computer and follow along, that would be ideal to get a sense of how this works. There are a couple examples here at the end that just give you a couple things to think about with linear models. There are times that uh, linear models, if you try to predict too far forward with them, you get kind of unrealistic results. So these examples just kind of highlight that reality and just kind of give you a sense that uh, sometimes you have to apply common sense to a linear model and notice that it's maybe not going to always be linear. Maybe the, the model will change in the future. So that's linear models in short. And again, you should go through and uh, read this and follow along with the examples and watch the videos as needed.